Thanks, Keith. Uh, that was a great introduction. And I would just like to start uh, by acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Wajat Noongar people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And also just to acknowledge that sovereignty on this land has never been ceded. Um, look, I also want to acknowledge that there's some real stalwarts of the union movement here. And, um, you know, uh, probably our elders uh, of the union movement. And I particularly actually want to mention Keith. There's three people I thank and occasionally blame for where I find myself. Um, the first is an old boiler maker called Alex Glasgow, who was a shop steward at the Qdale workshops and persuaded me to step up as a shop steward. Um, the second is Keith, um, who persuaded me when he saw me coming to meetings. I don't know why he noticed me. I mean, you know, there was me and a whole lot of blokes. Um, <laughs> but I think he thought, we need another boiler maker in the office. That's what we need. Um, uh, he, he encouraged me, um, offered me my first job uh, at the AMWU, uh, and also uh, Simone McGurk, who was an organiser and... Um, you know, one of the gutsiest people I knew, uh, and I uh, modelled myself on her as well. So uh, there to thank, there to blame. Um, Keith stole my lines about Harold, but I, I will again say I never met Harold, but I, I only ever heard, you know, wonderful things about him. And when people talk about Harold, uh, talked about Harold to me, they talked about integrity um, and honesty and always thinking about what workers wanted. Um, so he's someone we can, all, um, we can all model ourselves on. And I think I did get a little bit of Harold because Don was, um, you know, my first year as a pre-apprentice, not quite knowing what I'd landed myself in for uh, as a boilermaking pre-apprenticeship. I, I spent a few hours sitting in his office, uh, you know, um, just chatting, I think, is probably what he let me think it was, but I now know with looking back that it was a bit of pastoral care. So thank you very much. Uh, look, this, this speech really came out of a chat with Keith um, about coming and talking here today. Um, and he asked me to talk about uh, unions and the gig economy. And I said, look, I could talk about that, but I'm not sure we've got a great story yet to tell about that. There's lots of us thinking about the gig economy and what we can do. Why don't I talk about some of the things that we are doing that I think apply to the gig economy um, and um, some of the organising that we're doing and particularly some of the organising we've been doing through COVID. Um, so look, it's called Union Strength in the COVID uh, era. Let me see if this works. Nope, it does not. It's kind of funny. I'm going to talk to you about digital organising. <laughs> Everyone in the union office laughed themselves silly when they heard that. They thought it was very funny. Um, nope. Back. <laughs> oh, yeah, OK. I think I've got... I just want to bring up the next bit. I'm sure I touched that one. <laughs> All right. Um, but look, the underlying thing is actually how COVID forced us to do a whole lot of stuff. A lot of it we knew already and we had been thinking for a long time, geez, we should do a whole lot more of this stuff. And, um, you know, COVID has been, I'm not, you know, COVID has been a terrible worldwide situation, the global pandemic, but it's also, um, you know, for many of us forced us to do a whole lot of things we knew we should be doing. Um, so look, I just want to start, you know, we all know the Change the Rules campaign, and that's an incredibly important campaign. And as unions and unionists, we should not accept that we have to um, operate under laws that make it so difficult for workers to win. You know, and I, I love the Change the Rules campaign. Uh, we have to continue to do it. We have to look at what we did last time and work out, you know, how we can continue to get that message across. But I think there is a whole discussion for us as well, alongside changing the rules. Um, and I, I will say a little bit more. I think particularly enterprise bargaining has slowly killed the movement. And it might have worked when it first came for certain industries. It, it 
it can work if you've got a mass of workers all employed by the one employer in a particular part of the economy, all of which I have to say is mostly where the blokes hang out. Um, so manufacturing, actually the public sector where we've got members that kind of works. Uh, it doesn't work in smaller fragmented workplaces. And some of those workplaces that do have those advantages, uh, like for example construction, you see one, the, the law's getting tougher and tougher, and two, the employers changing the um, employment relationships so they no longer have that advantage. So the days of stopping the concrete pour, because everybody was employed by the one builder, has now been undermined by layers and layers of contracting and subcontracting. Um, so change the rules, uh, but I will say we always knew the rules didn't work for our industries and many industries for women. But really we also have to have a debate about change the union. What are we doing that doesn't work in this situation and this, this world that we find ourselves in, particularly with the types of employment that we now see? Um, and so we start, it, we start that conversation, and it's interesting, we talk about this. Uh, I now work, you know, I work for United Workers Union. We're an amalgamation of the old Stormont and Packers and um, the uh, United Voice or LHMU or MISOs. Um, you know, we cover a really wide range of members, uh, some of whom do live in that world uh, where, where bargaining works for them. Uh, but we start to talk about why we need to uh, have different ways of organising and why we need to change the way we operate as a union. And we do start with gig economy. That is, the, I think, kind of the apex of, of exploitation, of terrible treatment, um, to the point that workers aren't even allowed to consider themselves workers. So you say, we've got to do something different when it comes to organising gig workers. In our world, though, you say HOSPO. You know, workers organise together in unions for decent jobs, respect and, and a pay that they can live on. That is not happening in hospitality uh, at the moment. But how do you organise thousands of workers who work in small, unrelated businesses, and all they have in common is the job they do, not necessarily the employer they do. So yeah, okay, we've got to do something for gig workers, we've got to do something for hospo workers. Home care. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, home care. Uh, so home care workers, they don't, have a, they don't have a place of employment. They get their job from their phone. Uh, they work two hours here, they have two hours break, they work two hours here. We cannot organise them in the way, we cannot organise them, as I like to say, because we don't spend very much money on infrastructure with a group of people in Hyundai's driving around <laughs> visiting, visiting workers. So home care workers, all of a sudden that makes sense. Um, this should say disability group homes. We thought, yeah, well, you know, we've got big employers, but actually, Every workplace probably has one or two people on at a time, if you've got five people with disabilities and a couple of workers. And then we said, you know, actually residential aged care, there's 100 people in our, in, in our areas working in most residential aged care facilities, but at any one time, there's probably 20 of them on shift and they all have different breaks. So you sit in the lunchroom, catch them for 15 minutes, they come in, they're tired, they're cranky, it's a hard job. So we've got to do something than just go and visit and have a union meeting with people. And then we said casinos, biggest employer in the state, biggest private sector employer in the state. But you probably don't know when you go and, you know, uh, have, a, have a gamble at the casino, the dealers are on 15 minute breaks every hour. And they're on different 15 minute breaks every time, so they're never with the same group of people. So how do you sit down and have an important union conversation with someone who's got 15 minutes to get off the floor, go to the toilet, grab something to eat, uh, say hello to their workmates and get back on the floor? Again, kind of doesn't work. And then actually, I was explaining this to, you know, some of our manufacturing people in our union, and they said, you know what, we walk into a lunchroom now, and yep, everyone's there, and it's a half an hour break, 
most people are watching Netflix on their mobile phone. So all of a sudden, we start to say, there's things we need to do in all of these places. So it starts, as I said, the pinnacle is the gig economy, but actually we have to change what we're doing. So we started to think about what we call new organising. And I want to start by saying new organising is old organising. It's not some special new different thing. It's about finding out the issues that matter to workers and, and dealing with them, developing leaders, identifying activists, uh, building union power through recruit, recruiting new members and then taking action together, using that power and taking it. So there's nothing different uh, between new organising and old organising. What is different is that we use different tools. So we organise online, we use digital tools, and we use different models of organising and building power. And I'll, I'm going to use an example to talk about that, because if I try and explain it, it gets... I'll, I'll use an example. But I'll start um, first. Oh, just a bit of context, and this blows my mind, right? On average, Australians spend five and a half hours a day online, uh, which is terrifying. I don't know where you get those statistics, but it's true. So when we talk about organising people in the community, that's a really big community and that's a really important place to connect with people. 87% of Australians have a smartphone. And when we first started this, sort of idea of digital organising, one of the things that people said to us is, oh, look, it's a bit of a class issue, it's an age issue, you know, not everyone's got an email address, not everyone's got a computer. Um, actually, our members, who are the working class of Australia now, the aged care workers, the farm workers, the, every one of them's got a phone, that's what they live and die on. You know, they might not have a computer, but they've got a smartphone. Um, they might be paying as you go on the data, but they've got it. Um, apparently, I check Facebook 10 to 20 times a day. Um, it's probably right, actually. Uh, shame on me, but it's true. And 25% of all people who visit an internet page start on Facebook and click through. And again, that's possibly me perusing you know, shoes and <laughs> clothes. Very rarely buy, but I always peruse. Um, so, you know, that's a bit of context to why we talk about digital organising. Um, so, as I said, you know, some of new organising is just using, the, using digital and online tools in a very standard way. So I might talk a bit about COVID and aged care. Um, and that's partly because it's what I know best and partly because we became completely digital for kind of seven or eight months of this year. And we not only did that, we grew, we prospered, we recruited members, we developed leaders and we campaigned. Um, so, you know, and just in terms of context, when COVID hit, as a union, United Workers Union made a decision that we weren't leaving the workplace. We represented essential workers. We were going to be in the workplace. If our members had to go to work every day in a hospital, in a school, in a, a, a logistics warehouse for Coles or Woolies, um, our union reps, um, our officials were going to go and stand side by side with them, providing them with the information and the support they needed. So we were like, we're ready to go. We're puffed up. We had the letters. We were going to take it to fair work. And then, of course, um, you know, state governments put out health directives, and one of them was basically that people couldn't visit aged care facilities. Uh, you know, got a bit of legal advice. Okay. So we were outside of the workplace at a time when our members were scared, confused, worried. There was apparently a lot of information, but I tell you, we got the CHC guidelines for infection control in COVID, 
uh, you needed a bloody university degree to read it and you had to look at page 7 and page 12 and page 3 and page 5 and put it all together. Uh, and people weren't even giving that to our members. So we had to be out there supporting them. So we learnt all that stuff we had kept saying we should learn. Um, you know, the first is something called peer-to-peer -peer texting. Um, and so basically, I can sit at my computer and send 100 texts at once. Um, and I can use our membership database. So Keith gets a text from me saying, hi, Keith, it's Carolyn from the union. Um, time, you know, times are a bit rough and scary with COVID. How's things going in your workplace? You know, and Mike gets it, and Bobby gets it, and Don gets it, and you know, and I remember this. My first, uh, my first run in with peer to peer texting uh, was in childcare. My partner is a childcare worker, and she said, "Someone called Mel from the union keeps texting me," and I'm like, "She's not texting you, love." <laughs> she was, and you can have a conversation, and you can have an individual conversation, but it's much faster then, you know, I'm pretty quick on text, but it's much faster than me sitting there doing that. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer texting was the first thing we did. We just did mass outreach to our members saying, how are you going? What's happening? Is there a plan in your workplace? You know, and you could have that conversation back. Have you been given that information? Do you know what PPE you should be getting? Are you getting it? Um, is there only one, uh, one uh, dispenser of hand sanitizer in your entire aged care facility that you've got to walk to because they're scared you're going to nick the little bottles, etc. cetera. Um, so that's, that's really important. That's how we started. Um, we started to talk to our members. We started having mass meetings with our members. As a union, right at the kind of first peak of COVID, we did a mass meeting. We did the biggest union mass meeting online that's ever happened in Australia with thousands and thousands of workers online. Um, so we, that was as, as, a, as a union. Um, in aged care, we did a safety mass meeting. People logged on. We, had, we got a talking head from infection control in the WA Health Department. We had members asking him questions. People could um, put questions in the chat. They could talk to us. Um, and that was really valuable. And we had about 600 members from around Australia uh, on that Zoom, um, getting that information, talking to us. Uh, we used it, you know, the Royal Commission has been going on into aged care. Uh, and the Royal Commission was particularly interested in issues around COVID. So we had, um, we had a Zoom about that. Um, whenever there was an outbreak in one of the uh, states, and look, you know, we didn't have New South Wales and Victoria, and I really feel for my HSU comrades uh, who dealt with the kind of the crazy situation in aged care in those states, but we did have outbreaks in our states. And we would have, um, we'd just call a Zoom meeting the next day. Um, and, you know, one of the things I learnt was it didn't have to be polished. It didn't have to be pretty. You know, you just get on there and talk to people. Um, from the safety, um, from the safety uh, Zoom that we did, we set up a closed Facebook group called the Aged Care um, Safety Network. Um, that morphed from, uh, and we had union delegates of that safety network. Does that make sense? So we had a group of leaders. It wasn't, you know, officials are on there, we make comments, but it's run by a group of leaders. They, they you know, if people ask questions, they make sure they get answered. If people haven't said anything for a while, they'll pop up and put a question on. And that group morphed very quickly from just being about safety to being, I guess, our way of connecting with members and members, more importantly, connecting with each other. We've got over 2,000 people on that uh, and we've just renamed it and 
God love industrial democracy, right? We had a group of leaders think of different names and we voted on it. So we've ended up with oh, aged care worker, aged care heroes standing together to something else. It's got a lot of words. I love it. They love it. It's industrial democracy, right? Um, you know, WhatsApp groups. We bargained, we ran a campaign in Aegis, in WA here. Uh, I won't explain the campaign, but, you know, every time we found someone who wanted to be a leader, we'd put them on the WhatsApp group. We talked constantly about what was going on, what happened next, what do we do next, how do we do that. Um, the officials were on there, we would answer legal questions, but they would answer questions for each other as well. Um, Online, we'd done a lot of online petitions and we'd actually done a whole lot of online petitions before. We kept doing them and we did them for a whole lot of reasons. Petitions are good things to do, but we also did them to um, reach out to people, to find new people who weren't in the union, uh, to have something for our activists to do. Um, so we built lists and in fact we found lists from old petitions of aged care workers who'd sign things. Again, I say to my partner when she's about to sign something, look, sign that online petition but just be aware someone is going to text you or ask you to do something if they're any good at campaigning. Um, so we would find people who would do that, who shared that petition, who put it up on their Facebook page. That's someone who wants to be active in the campaign. We would reach out to them, we'd text them, say, hey, we saw you shared that. Do you want to share it some more? Where do you work? Is there a union rep in your workplace? Do you want to be the union rep in your workplace? Um, yeah, so next time. Sign the petitions, sign all the petitions, just be aware. Um, and that, we also talked to people who weren't union members who'd signed that petition or maybe had signed a petition three years ago and we'd never followed them up because we're too busy getting in our Hyundais and driving out to workplaces. Um, and we signed up huge numbers of new members. We'd, we'd text them until, you know, we said, hey, you want to join the union? Why can't I, shall I talk to you about that? Are you around now? When's a good time to ring you? Um, and so, you know, we went, we, you know, we had six or seven people in that team and I'd come in, well, we were working from home, but when we were back in the office, they'd be there, you know, each of them with their little earphones clicked in saying, hey, Donella, probably if you're working in aged care, how are you going? You know, let's talk about these issues. Um, we've held, uh, we hold now Australia-wide leaders meetings for our campaign. Um, you know, we talked when we first you know, we just amalgamated as a union and we just kind of moved from this old idea of having kind of nation states um, and, you know, branches in each state to, ha to, to wanting to build a truly national union and a national campaign. And we were like, how are we going to do that? Well, apparently you do it by doing national stuff. So we now have what we call our warriors meeting. We have a Zoom meeting. Um, on a Saturday afternoon and we have 50 or 60 of our leaders on that. And um, they're pretty interesting actually because um, when we do the town halls, people can see us but it's kind of broadcast. When you're doing a Zoom leaders meeting, they're all in the meeting. So you do spend a lot of time either saying, can you put, can you put it on mute? Because you can hear them rustling around or I can't hear you, you're on mute. Um, my favourite moment was the time that the you know, woman who had a small child and a baby uh, went to put her baby down and left her phone there and her little three-year-old, cute little son was there going... <laughs> and I'm looking, trying to give a report on the aged care campaign and all I could see in one of the squares is this kid going... <laughs> Anyhow. Mum came back, thank God. Um, look, we did a whole lot of surveys, a whole lot of surveys, and we were doing um, work with the Royal Commission. We were putting in a, um, we we're putting in another uh, a submission about the impact of COVID in aged care. 
Um, so we had huge response to them. Um, uh, but a bit like the petition, uh, good, you know, participate, that's great. If you share it, you're an activist and we're going to go after you. If you're a non-member and you've signed, we're going to go and talk to you as well. And look, we did a whole lot of stuff with Facebook ads and Google ads. So Facebook has this amazing thing that we can give them a data set of what our members look like in aged care. And generally they look like older white working class women and younger women of colour from the Philippines, Africa, and um, now the subcontinent. You know, so it, here's our database, you know, not their names, but this is kind of who they are. And they, they make sure those Facebook ads pop up in front of people who look like them. It's some crazy, scary shit, but it's really great for union organising. Um, and similar with Google, you know, you pop into Google, safety in aged care. You pop into Google, uh, aged care award rates. You pop into Google, PPE, COVID PPE, aged care. Uh, we're going to find you and we're going to talk to you online. So look, that is the sort of stuff that we've been doing for six or seven months. It's really, it's really interesting. I will I should have probably put this in a bit of context. These really are new tools in an existing campaign. So we're running a sort of, we've been running a couple of years and we see it as probably a 10 year campaign uh, to change aged care, to change residential aged care, um, to get a staffing levels ratios, to get a decent wage, to get people to get an, a decent job so they don't have to work two or three jobs. Uh, which is good for them and, by the way, good for the residents, as we saw in Victoria. So we really used, we saw this 12 months as a time to stand with our members in a really scary, horrible time, but also in terms of our campaign, we were looking for leaders, uh, building strength in terms of building members, getting people used to being active, getting people used to working together. So, so that's how we did it. And that's how we kind of did it online. So our aim was to build industry power. We've got a big year next year. The Royal Commission um, report comes out. And, you know, we've been talking to aged care workers about, um, you know, this is the time to change aged care. There'll never be a better time. This is our moment. We're going to have the moral authority of the Royal Commission. We're going to have um, probably a federal election. And because of COVID and the deferred bargaining that we're going to do, we did, we didn't bargain this year, uh, except for a few employers who insisted, we're going to have over 50% of the industry coming up for bargain in July next year. So, you know, watch this space. We're going to, even though we haven't got the laws to industry bargain, we're going to industry bargain. So it's been really actually something we needed to learn to do if we're going to run a campaign like this. Um, that's what you do in somewhere where you have an existing union presence. It's not a strong union presence in aged care. It's not a high density workplace, but it, it has got a history and a tradition uh, of unionism. But what do we do in areas that are totally non-union and we want to organise them? And the hospo industry is a great example of that. Um, and I was going to talk to you about what we've been doing in Hossabo Voice and Fair Plate, and I went on the website and they had a little explainer video, so I thought I'd give you a break from me. That is the sound that you heard. Okay. Ooh, look at this. It's going to work. Whew. Uh, but I don't know how, Beck, I don't know how to start this because it's not on here. Because the ah yes, I think you should be able to just move. There we go. Oh, yeah. oh that's See? magic. Go. Want to be part of the history in the making? We're about to turn the tables on Georgie Gossip's all over Australia. With no union, Georgie Cosco bosses got away with billions of dollars in wage theft and treated us. Hospital workers in Victoria cooked up Australia's first digital union, combining powerful online tools and a Netflix style. 
Utah leadership. With grassroots activism and online campaigns, we use the power of us all to shine a light and make some noise. Our Fair Play website gave workers a way to serve some justice by anonymously rating their worst and best bosses so patrons could see who was on the level. We helped to make more wage theft a national issue and cut some big names down to size. The legal system is failing hospitality workers. Wage theft, exploiting thousands of young workers. They're only paid. Accused of underpaying their staff. The hospital lawyers union say wage theft should be treated as a criminal offence. Okay, so um, I think that gives you a little sense of what we've been doing, and that is years of work. Uh, it's probably five years ago I remember sitting at a national executive of United Voice and people were talking about, you know, uh, a digital union and what that might mean. And people tried things and they failed and they tried things and they worked and they kind of got here. Um, I think what, you know, one of the questions people said uh, when we first started talking about this is, you know, if we started unions in 2020, they probably wouldn't look anything like what they look like now. You know, we are a, we are a beast of our history, like, like, like we all are. So what would it look like if we started? And that, I, that blew my mind. I was like, what are you saying? What do you mean? But I think this starts to give you a sense of, uh, of what, what was happening. But what I want to do is just talk a little bit about an actual example to... Um, Okay, I want to talk a bit about an example. So what do you mean? What is this digital union? What's this Netflix style membership? You know, how do you organise online? How do you organise uh, HOSPO workers? And I think uh, Watson's Bay Boutique Hotel is a, a really good case study. So they mentioned the Fair Play website in the video. So I'll just start there. So we start with what are we trying to do here? What are unions about? It is that basic. Unions are about building decent jobs where people get fair pay and respect. You know, so start at ground zero before you start to build what you want to, what you want to build. And what does that mean in hospitality? Because in hospitality, uh, it seems like there's nowhere else to go. You leave a job and there's another job. You leave a job and there's another job and they're all the same. So how do you fix that? You know, the old thing would be, well, we'll prosecute the employer for wage theft. And by the time you finish, they've closed down that company and started another one. 
Um, and that means people would have to pay massive union fees because that's a very expensive model. So how do we do it? So one of the things we decided was this Fair Plate website. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. Um, hospitality lives on its, uh, you know, people like Heston Blumenthal, Neil Perry, George Columbaris, live on their public images, these great guys doing fantastic things. So the Fair Plate website lets people rate their boss. The employers hate it. Um, now, it gives bouquets as well as brickbats. So we have uh, uh, hospitality venues that we say these venues get consistently good, you know, that they're accredited fair plate uh, venues. Uh, but then we have places that, um, you know, consistently get bad reviews. Now, Watson Bay Boutique Hotel, Watson Bay, very posh part of Sydney, um, by, by, the, by the shore in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. When Fair Plate went national, within a week, we had five bad reviews of Watson's Bay, saying this is a terrible place, the boss is a bully, you know, we work 60 hours a week and only get paid for 40. Um, so we have, we have organisers in this digital union they just don't get into cars. So Zara, our online organiser, contacted them, contacted the five people and said, hey, do you want to talk about this? What's going on? It seems like there's a problem. We've had five bad reviews. And she identified um, a, a leader called uh, Jeanina, Jeanina. She was on a visa from the Philippines, had been bought out by Watson's Bay. Um, she, I am going to have to read my glasses because use my glasses to read this. Um, she, we noticed she was an activist because she'd shared the link around. That's how we'd got five reviews. So she made contact, um, expanded the pool, and we eventually had 40 current and former workers from Watson's Bay and, of course, being a hospo um, venue, it wasn't a venue, it was an empire. Um, they, they had the hide to call themselves the Sydney Collective. Um, <laughs> not very collective. Uh, should have called themselves Sydney Capitalists. They had nine venues. And we found 40 people who'd been uh, significantly underpaid. So we worked with those workers who were and we got them to the point that they were prepared to speak out in the media. So we went to a current affair. Uh, we went to a current affair and we went to, um, yeah, we went to a current affair. We had a petition online. So you've got to create the sound and movement and the pressure on someone like a current affair to put that story up. We had 5,000 people sign the petition demanding justice. We went to current affair. Um, uh, it took about three months for us to get that story up, three or four months to get that story up. Um, 60 Minutes dropped it, so we'd gone to 60 Minutes. A current affair hit pause. They wouldn't do it unless they had five or six workers who were prepared to go on the record. Um, and that's a big ask, right? Go on the record to say uh, you've been ripped off. Um, when, when the story aired on A Current Affair, um, the employer had a go at us, had a go at Hospital Voice and Fair Plate, um, you know, uh, found a friendly right-wing sh radio shock jock who said he was ambushed, it was terrible, it was very, very unfair. Um, but actually that worked. That was great. It amplified our message. We, we hoped that would happen, and it did. So there was a whole lot of news stories about how terrible we were, but it amplified the message. Um, look... You know, so far we've got $50,000 out of the Sydney Collective. Our activist, Janina, has so far got $30,000. We think they're owed a lot more. I, um, I was talking to our Sydney uh, uh, State, our New South Wales State Secretary, and she'd rung me. She was walking back from a meeting she'd had with those workers and their bosses. And the, uh, the original meeting room they set up uh, failed because of COVID requirements. So they actually said, let's go and meet at the boss's headquarters. And she rang the workers and said, do you feel intimidated? They're like, no, no, no. So they met in this penthouse 
sort of office in the Sydney CBD, which made it much, much harder for the boss to say, we're so poor, we can't pay you properly. Um, there is a bit of uh, vision in the current affair story of him saying it was an Excel spreadsheet error. It happens sometimes. Um, so look, um, you know, more wins to have in that. Uh, the other win is that, of course, most of these, most of this action happens after people have left the workplace, you know, but we now have put pressure on and they are paying correctly at Watson's Bay Boutique Hotel. They're paying properly, people are being paid. She now has a job as a chef at Crown, uh, which is just opening, well, maybe opening up. Uh, that's a whole nother story. And we have got a red hot activist. She will live or die for the union for the rest of her life um, because of the win she had. So I think it's really interesting, isn't it? You have to think about how you do this, how you do this in a different way. How do you put pressure on employers? It's not by t going out on strike, which is what, you know, is a great and very important union activity. Um, it's not by prosecuting them. Uh, it's not by going and visiting the lunchroom and telling the boss off. How do we do that? How do workers join together, take collective action and uh, win change? So look, there are a couple of examples. As I said, one of an existing workplace um, or an existing relatively unionised industry and how we use those tools. The second is how do we use this, you know, in an industry we could not ever unionise by just going and visiting the workplace and talking to workers, uh, being online but also thinking about how you pressure the boss in a totally different way to what we've done before uh, was what we did. Um, just to bring it back round to gig workers, what does that mean? I think there's a whole lot of lessons there for us about how we organise gig workers. And we know the first challenge with gig workers is this lie that they're not employees and they're not workers, that they somehow woke up one day and decided to set up a small business that involved a bicycle and an and a insulated backpack. Um, but I think, again, if we're going to organise those industries, Every worker can be organised. Every worker has common issues. They have obvious common issues. It's just working out how we get them together as a collective, how we build leadership, and then how they exert pressure on what we know is their employer. So um, thanks again. for having. Thanks for having me. I really appreciated it. It's great to see Don again um, and, of course, Keith. Um, and I really appreciate the time tonight. Thank you.